So I am Dr. Betsy Green, and you will meet our other people, Ashley Wright, and I kind of came up with this um, animal project educational webinar series, and we wanted Ashley's shown up there. And then Ashley Jeff for sample is our, our 4-H agent that is down way in South, South Arizona that's helping us uh, get the people connected to tell us about the individual projects after we've learned about the species. So tonight I'll start out with a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll turn it over to Ashley Wright who will introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Colt Knight. And Ashley Jeffers Sample will finish us up with 4-H swine projects. So this is the Arizona Ag at Home, Learn, Do, Teach webinar series number two, Swine Basics. And so just a little housekeeping and just a, just a reminder of webinar etiquette, etiquette overall. So all of you as participants are muted and your, and your videos are muted as well. That's how the webinars are set up. And part of the reason is because we've got a lot of great information to cover in a short time. So the ways that you can ask questions is you can clearly type your questions into the question and answer box. You can also know that it might not get answered right away because it might be something that um, Dr. Knight will be covering later. And so he may say, you know what, I'll catch that and see if we answer it in the talk. And then of course, obviously, please be polite and respectful in the chat. And after the fact, we will have uh, do some minor editing and then this recording will be available later online. So if you have people that could not make it, then they will still be able to watch it. Right now, if you missed the rabbit presentation a couple of um, weeks ago, that is now online where you registered for this one. Just need to scroll down and you can actually watch that video too. And we don't ever want this to happen, but if there's inappropriate or harassing behavior, that participant will be removed without warning, but we don't want that to happen. We just wanna have a great educational informational session. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley Wright and Colt can probably put his slides up while she's introducing. Hi everyone. Uh, so as Betsy mentioned, mentioned, I'm Ashley Wright. I am the livestock area agent um, for the Cooperative Extension, I'm based down in Cochise County. Primarily, I do work on cattle, but I get to do a little bit of other things. And today, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Colt Knight, who is currently the Assistant Extension Professor and the State Livestock Specialist with the University of Maine. And Colt did his PhD here at the University of Arizona. So that's how we have that connection. So Colt, I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, we will, when we get to the polls, I'll go ahead and launch those for you so you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, as Ashley said, I'm, I'm up here at the University of Maine uh, and we get a lot of questions about pigs up here in Maine and, and uh, Ashley and Betsy thought it would be handy if, if we shared some, some information about pigs in Arizona as well. So uh, if you are new to pigs, uh, you'll learn a lot, and I bet even if you have pigs and have been around pigs for a while, you'll learn some stuff that you didn't know from this presentation. So just to get started so we can kind of gauge the audience here, uh, how many amongst us have pigs now? While we're answering this question, just uh, I manage the University of Maine registered Berkshire pig herd, and I also have a registered Berkshire herd at my house. We just had piglets five weeks ago, so I've got little bacon seeds running around everywhere right now. All right, it looks like most of them have voted. I'm going to go ahead and end the polling. Do you want me to share it with them so they can see it? 
So here you are. It looks like we've got um, about nine that have pigs and seven that want pigs and 10 that don't have pigs. So, okay. All right. Well, to get started and make sure that everybody's on the same base, let's go over some, some pig definitions. And, and one of the questions that I get asked about quite often uh, is what's the difference between a hog and a pig? And the answer to that question depends on where you're looking for the answer. So in certain parts of the country, uh, like in the Midwest or in the South, uh, everything being raised as a meat animal would be referred to as a hog. And they would say pig to mean piglet. Now, but if we were to look at the dictionary definition, uh, we would see that hogs are just big pigs that weigh at least 120 pounds. But depending on where you're at in the country, you'll see these terms used interchangeably and I'll be using them interchangeably today. The Latin term for pig is porcine, much like the uh, Latin term for cattle is bovine, sheep is ovine, deer is servine, and pigs are porcine. Uh, baby pigs are, are called piglets. A recently weaned pig may be referred to as a shoat. And again, that's a kind of an old school term that was really common a hundred years ago, but not so common these days. Uh, here in New England, we still use this term, but it's uh, basically just a recently weaned pig. Uh, most of the big industry pig operations would call those nursery pigs or wieners. Uh, and then the female parent is the dam and the male parent is the sire. That is consistent across all livestock species. One term you may not be familiar with if you've not been around pigs uh, is guilt. And that is a young female pig that has not yet had a litter of pigs. A sow is a female pig after she has farrowed. And the term farrow is the actual process of a sow giving birth to piglets. Uh, intact males are boars. A castrated or fixed male is referred to as a barrow. And another old school term that you don't hear a lot these days, but in certain parts of the country you may uh, run across this, is stag. And that is an older male pig that has outused his usefulness on the farm as a reproductive animal. And he's going to be sent to slaughter. One of the problems, though, when you slaughter uncastrated or intact male pigs is they can suffer from something called boar taint. Uh, so once boars reach sexual maturity and especially after they uh, have reproduced, uh, they produce a certain hormone that taints the smell of the meat. And, and if you're ever around this, it smells like burning urine in the cook pot or on the fryer. Uh, so it is a very unpleasant sensation to be around. So we don't eat a lot of intact males in the United States because of this reason. Now, not all humans have the smell receptors to sense boar taint. So if you're ever around some people that swear that, that boar taint is a myth, those are probably the people that do not have those receptors. Uh, to smell that nasty boar taint. So one of the things that they used to do in the old days is they would take that boar and castrate it and then wait 30 or 45 days for that animal to heal up and some of those hormones to work through their, their system. And that would reduce the incidence of boar taint. And that brings us to our second question. How big do pigs get?
All right, it looks like we've had about a little over 80% have voted. So if you, last chance, last call, get them in. And I'm gonna close the polling here. All right, polling is closed. And I'm gonna share the results. How'd they do? Well, pretty good considering. So when we raise pigs for meat in this country, uh, not too long ago, we raised pigs until they were about 250 pounds, uh, and then they were sent to the processor. Uh, however, in recent times, uh, just like with beef cattle, we are raising larger and larger hogs. So it's not uncommon now to see hogs being sent to the processor that weigh in excess of 300 pounds. National average is probably right at 285 pounds for hogs being sent to slaughter. However, pigs really don't stop growing if you continue to feed them. They're kind of like a goldfish. They, they keep growing until they die if you keep packing the feed to them. And, and so in some of the Midwestern states, they even have at their state fairs, the largest hog or largest boar competition. Uh, and those animals easily weigh over a thousand pounds. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, the news about Hogzilla down south, uh, the big feral hog that was killed. Uh, I believe that particular animal was eating uh, catfish food from a local catfish farm and that's why it got so big out in the wild. Uh, but sows and boars that we keep as breeding stock on on commercial farms and, and, uh, and, and other pig farms, generally the sows will weigh between five and 600 pounds. Sometimes they get a little bigger and the boars can weigh up to 700 pounds in those situations. However, if you keep pouring the feed to them, uh, they'll get bigger and bigger until they die. Oops, so let's keep rolling here. Let's go over some, some fun pig facts. Uh, one of the first things, if you've never been around pigs, uh, pigs are, are very intelligent uh, and they're very personable. Uh, pigs are very friendly towards people for the most part. Uh, they're very intelligent. You can teach them to do tricks. Uh, they're, they're right along with dogs on intelligence levels and trainability levels. Now they're not dogs, so they act differently and pigs, usually don't differentiate people as people, but they just treat us like other pigs. So sometimes you, you gotta watch them because pigs love to wrestle and fight with each other and pigs will wrestle and fight with you just like they do other pigs. So it can be dangerous uh, to walk into a pen full of pigs, uh, especially if they're big pigs and you're a small statured person, they can knock you over and start wrestling with you and actually injure you. Uh, that would bring me to to my next point, they routinely eat a diet of both vegetable and meat. And uh, there have been cases where pigs have eaten people. It's not common, but it has happened. Uh, if you've ever had the opportunity to touch a pig's snout, it looks really soft, uh, but it's actually very hard, almost like a hammer. And when they nuzzle you, or rub their nose up against your leg, they can actually leave a bruise. And they use that to do what we call root. Uh, and you see the pigs in this picture are rooting up the ground. They're turning over the soil. Uh, back in the old days, the, the old timers actually used pigs as a plow. So if they had an area they wanted to till up for a garden back before we had tillers and modern farm equipment, uh, they would fence the pigs off in that area and let them tear up the soil or if they had land that they wanted to clear out of tall brush and shrubs, they would fence the pigs off in that area and let the pigs destroy that area uh, so that they could clear it off for pasture at a later date. Pigs do not smell bad uh, when they are kept in a clean, dry environment. Uh, you know, it's not until they're kept in mud or their unclean pens that you start having pig smell issues. 
Uh, and if you've ever driven by a large scale commercial swine operation, uh, the reasons that those have a smell is because those animals are raised on uh, raised concrete slats and underneath of them is a sewage pit that collects all their waste, manure and water and feed. Uh, and then they flush that into a big storage tank. And when that storage tank is full, they take that and they use it as fertilizer and spray it on uh, the crops in the local vicinity. So you don't see a lot of large scale hog operations everywhere in the United States uh, because a lot of states have environmental laws that prevent large scale pig operations because you have to house so much of that waste uh, until you can use it as fertilizer. So you mostly see large scale swine operations in the center part of the country where there's lots of field crops. Uh, North Carolina, Tennessee, Iowa, states like that. Uh, there are, is about one pig for every three to four people in the world. That's about two billion pigs in the world. Uh, pigs produce pork, bacon, ham, and sausage. Wild pigs are often referred to as boars. However, most wild pigs in the United States are actually feral pigs and not wild boars. Uh, and the difference between a wild boar and a feral pig is that feral pigs are just farm pigs that have gotten loose from the farm. Uh, in a lot of areas, there were economic hardships and the pigs escaped or pigs just got out of the fence. Or in some cases, uh, people turn pigs loose for hunting preserves uh, and then the pigs get out, breed like rabbits and multiply uh, and end up creating a feral population of pigs which can be quite destructive to the local environment. So you can see in this picture just how disruptive pigs can be to the soil. And uh, feral pigs can go through places that have like orchards or field crops or golf courses and, and tear up several acres a night really easily. Now, if you're thinking about raising pigs, if, if you're new to pigs and you wanna get a show animal or you just wanna raise some pigs for meat production, uh, you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of pig do I want to get? You know, like other livestock species, there are different breeds of pigs, but we can break pig breeds down into modern commercial pigs versus heritage breed pigs. And modern commercial pigs have been genetically selected over the last several generations for lean meat production. So our ham and bacon and ribs and, and that kind of thing, pork chops. Uh, and we have our stereotypical white pigs that we raise in large scale confinement operations. So when you buy pork at the grocery store, you are buying a hybrid white pig. They are a mix of land race and Yorkshire pigs. And we also have show pigs. So you'll have different things like Hampshire's, Dura-Rocks, Berkshire's, all kinds of different show pigs. And then there's people that just raise them in their backyard or out on pasture uh, so that they can have their own source of meat or they've got a local farmer's market that they supply to. Uh, but then there are some folks that like to raise heritage breed pigs. And, and what that means is these are the old world genetics, pigs that were raised uh, similarly to 100 years ago or so. Uh, now, the big difference between the genetics of those pigs versus our modern commercial pigs is that heritage bred pigs were bred for lard production because 100, 200 years ago, the number one asset that we gained from pigs was not pork, but actually lard. Now, in the modern day, we don't sell much lard. So we have to utilize these heritage breed animals a little differently and manage them differently uh, so that we don't produce just tons of amounts of lard that we can't sell. 
Now, some popular breeds that, that you're going to see probably in the 4-H world when you're out showing pigs or at the state fairs or whatnot uh, would be something like a Berkshire. And, and they're known for really high quality pork, uh, very similar to a Duroc pig, also known for really high quality pork. But in addition to that, Durocs are also known to survive outside really well, which is important, especially in places like Arizona, because just like people, pigs can sunburn. So white pigs are very susceptible to sunburn. Uh, and if they get sunburned really bad, just like people, it can cause a lot of stress or even medical issues. So we gotta watch that. So if you're raising pigs outside, it's better to get a dark skinned pig with a darker color hair uh, to help shield them from some of that sunburn. Uh, we've got Hampshire pigs, they're black and white and they look similarly to a belted Galloway cow. So almost Oreo color. Uh, the land race pig, I've got some pictures of these that we'll go through here in a little bit. So let's just go through the pictures. I think that does a better job. Uh, here's the Berkshire sow with her litter of piglets. Uh, Berkshires have six white points at minimum. So they have four white feet, a white tail and a white snout. And they have to have uh, at least six teats on the left side and at least six teats on the right side. You can tell them apart from some of the other pigs with a similar color uh, because they have erect ears and they stand relatively low to the ground. Now, if we were to compare that to a black Poland China pig, you'll see that this is a much larger frame pig and he has or she has droopy ears instead of those perk ears. Now, in addition to the black Poland China pig, we also have a spotted Poland China pig. And they are just black and white spotted pigs that originally came from China. Uh, and so 15, 20 years ago, we would have said, you know, black Poland or spotted Poland China pigs don't have a lot of muscle, uh, but we have improved their genetics so much since then. Uh, you can now find these just as heavily muscled as any other pig. This is a Chester White, very common white pig to have around. It's a good old Duroc pig. You'll notice that red color. Here is a Hampshire pig. Notice that pretty white stripe running through the middle. Uh, Hampshires are known for uh, lean meat production. And so that's really important if you're trying to raise lean meat and not put on a lot of fat on these animals. So they wouldn't be good for sausage production, but uh, extremely popular in the show world. And then we have the next two, which are probably the two most popular breeds in the United States. And that's the land race pig. The land race pig is like the limousine of the pig world. They are extra long. Uh, they usually don't pack on a lot of body condition, so you'll see that they, they're not as fat or heavily muscled as some other pigs, but you will notice uh, how long this pig looks when compared to something like a Yorkshire. And the reason for that is land race pigs have been genetically selected for larger and larger litter sizes. Uh, so these pigs have actually developed extra ribs so they are actually extra long and with that extra length we get more bacon and more loin length so that's why they're so common to have in commercial setting but they don't pack on a lot of meat so they get mixed or crossed with yorkshire pigs so you can see this pig has a lot more body condition on it so a lot more fat and a lot more muscle uh, but not as long as this land race. So if we mix these two, we actually get piglets that grow quickly, put on lots of uh, meat, have large litter sizes, and do well in modern swine operations. Now on the heritage breed side, 
side. Uh, there's lots of breed of animals, uh, but some of the more common ones would be the American guinea hog. Uh, these are popular with homesteaders and backyard producers because they are much smaller pigs and the sows don't get 600 pounds. The sows get two or 300 pounds or sometimes even less. And so they don't eat as much. So a lot of people really like that feature. Hereford hogs look a lot like a Hereford cow. They're red with, with white appointments. Uh, here recently, uh, gourmet chefs have been using Hereford hog meat to make gourmet lean sausage and high-end charcuterie. So they're getting more and more popular. Uh, large black hogs, you probably won't see very many of these in, in Arizona, but they're very popular in Canada uh, because they are so hardy in harsh conditions. You know, they can weather the snow and rainstorms and live outside because of their big bulky size. Uh, now, there are some trade-offs to that. You know, they have small litter sizes. Uh, they are not feed efficient and they get really big. So they eat lots of feed. So you'll see a lot of folks raising pasture pigs uh, crossbreed with large black hogs to get some of those good aspects, but also breed with a good meat hog to kind of bring in some good meat and production efficiency. Uh, we have mule foot hogs, which are really neat because they have a solid hoof like a mule. And back in the early 1900s, we had this uh, great hog cholera outbreak that was decimating the hog population in the United States. But the mule foot hog uh, was actually resistant to hog cholera. So it's a, probably a good idea that we keep these animals around uh, so that we can breed in some genetic resistance to things like hog cholera to the rest of our breeds. Uh, red wattle hogs are unique because they have wattles like a goat. I don't believe that they serve any purpose, but if they look neat when you look at them. Uh, and then there's the Tamworth hog. They look a lot like that Duroc that we pictured. They're red pigs. Uh, they have great feed efficiency and great uh, muscling, but they're also known to have really bad tempers. It's really tough to keep these animals in a fence and they like to knock people over and things. So this is a, an expert pig to raise. Uh, one of the cool things to note about these Tamworth pigs is this is probably the closest thing that we have to what was being raised in the uh, Middle Ages in Europe. So this is probably the closest thing that we have to a real true heritage breed animal that was raised that looks a lot like pigs were four or 500 years ago. And then something that's gaining popularity here recently in the United States is the Mangalista hog. And you might say, well, what's a Mangalista hog? And they are just big old fuzzy hairy hogs. This is actually a Hungarian breed. And the unique thing about these guys is they were living in the forests off acorns and whatever they could scavenge. But when Hitler blockaded Hungary and several countries in Europe, uh, the locals were actually able to survive because they had these hogs to slaughter and they had lots of, of lard. So there, there was lots of nutrition there to help keep them through those hard times. Uh, so if you look at the big hump on this animal's back, that's actually back fat. These pigs can get six, eight inches of back fat. So lots of lard production on here. Now these guys grow really slow. They have tons of hair. Uh, if you were to look at one of these from a distance in a field, you may even think it's a sheep. They can get so fuzzy. Uh, there's the Tamworth pig that we discussed earlier. There's the, the Hereford hog that we talked about earlier. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about Hereford hogs. So right now, average slaughter weight of hogs in America is about 285 pounds. Average finishing weight on these Hereford hogs is around 240 pounds. So they're a little bit smaller. They're not as small as like an American guinea hog or a cooney cooney pig, uh, but definitely a smaller statue pig. On the swine reproduction side, uh, pigs are pregnant 
for about 115 days. And the old axiom for that is three months, three weeks, and three days. So if you can remember three months, three weeks, and three days, you'll always remember how long pigs are pregnant for. And what's really cool is, you know, species like horses can vary, you know, by three weeks, plus or minus sometimes. Uh, cattle can be a, a week or two sometimes. Pigs generally are really close to 115 days, plus or minus two or three days. And generally speaking, if a gilt takes 113 days, then she'll probably take 113 days every pregnancy thereafter. Uh, so if you, you keep records and write that stuff down, you can usually time when they're going to farrow within a day or two. So that's pretty handy. Uh, modern commercial pigs reach sexual maturity between five and six months old. Uh, we want those pigs to weigh about 300 to 350 pounds uh, before we breed them the first time. Whereas heritage breed animals grow slower uh, because we have to limit feed them because if we give them a free choice diet like we do commercial pigs uh, they put on too much fat and they, and they end up just being butterball turkeys we don't get a lot of meat production we get a lot of fat production uh, so they usually take about a year to reach sexual maturity and then in the case of something like that mangalista hog they take about a year and a half to reach sexual maturity now because pigs are pregnant for that 115 days, you can actually get two litters one year, three litters the next year. Uh, so if, if you've got a really tight operation, you can average two and a half litters of pigs per year per sow. And generally speaking, they're gonna have between eight to 12 piglets per litter. Now, if you're raising something like a land race or a Yorkshire pig, they may have 12 to 18 pigs per litter. And I remember one time when I was an undergraduate working at the University of Kentucky, we had a land race sow that had, uh, I believe it was 23 piglets in one farrowing. So you can have quite large litters. And what large scale production operations do, if they have, you know, 12 sows all farrowing within a couple days of each other, if sow one has six piglets and sow two has 20 piglets, they'll actually transfer some of those piglets over to sow one so that uh, they have easier access to milk and they'll grow stronger and quicker and faster. And if you're thinking about keeping pigs, there's a couple things you need to know about pig housing. Uh, and on a small scale, you don't need a lot to keep pigs. The big thing is that it needs to be a well-ventilated structure that is clean and dry. And so up here in Maine, you know, we have to worry about the cold winters. And so a lot of times people will uh, wrap the, the pig barn up in plastic and it won't have any ventilation. And that's bad because while it prevents breezes and snow from blowing in the barn, uh, as the animals breathe, they actually put moisture into the air. And as the air gets more humid, the pigs actually are colder because high humidity in cold weather makes it uh, where they feel colder. Also, if it's not well ventilated, uh, smells and things like that can build up, CO2 can build up, and it's an unhealthy environment. Now, the thing that you'd have to worry about in Arizona is heat stress, right? So it needs to be exceptionally well vent ventilated. Uh, and in some cases, maybe if you're closer to Tucson or Yuma or something, maybe you would want to have a mister to have some evaporative cooling going on for those pigs. Uh, if you plan to have a pasture or an outdoor paddock area for pigs, uh, the first thing you have to do is train the pigs to a fence. So when you first put your pigs out in a past pasture or paddock, it's a good idea to have a 
firm hard wire fence, something like a hog panel or, or stout woven wire fence uh, that is a physical barrier from the pigs just running through it or rooting up through it or tearing it up because they will tear up fences. Uh, and then you run some electric fence along the inside of that hard wire fence and you train the pigs to what an electric fence is. And once the pigs are trained to electric fence, uh, then you can just keep them out on any pasture paddock you'd like with about two strands of electric wire. But you have to train the pigs first. If you just throw pigs out with an electric fence, they walk up to the electric fence, the fence will bite them, and they are just as likely to run through the fence as they are to back away from the fence. Uh, the other thing that's really important to note here with electric fence and pigs is do not electrify the gate. Uh, pigs are smart. They learn that the electric fence will bite them. And if there is an electric fence across the gate, even if you take the electric fence down and open the gate, they don't want to go through the gate because they say, you're tricking us. There's an electric fence there and it's going to bite us. Uh, and this can cause some serious trouble when you go to move your pigs because they will not go through that open gate space uh, if it had been electrified prior to that. So this is probably a, a good place to stop and see if there's any questions. We do have a few questions. Um, while they're answering the poll, which I think I've launched, um, we have uh, two questions related to breeds of pig. Uh, the first one is, what's the simplest way to tell a landrace and a chester apart? Oh, All right, let me see if I can go back. So here's a chester pig. Chester pigs are short and round like a football. And you see how they have a, a kind of a more perky ears that go over their eyeballs and there's lots of good body condition on these animals and they're kind of short to the ground. Now, if we look at a land race pigs, you'll see that they have droopier skin. Uh, their ears are usually quite floppy, like a cocker spaniel. This pig is eating, so she's excited. So her ears are, are, are a little perk right now. Uh, but just look at the length. And if you really, really want to get in there, you can actually feel along their ribs and count their ribs. And those land race pigs will have two extra ribs. So they'll have uh, uh, 15 or 16 ribs. Right. That's the easiest uh, way to tell them apart. It's just by the overall length of the pig. And, and those Yorkshires are more football shaped. And uh, the land races are usually droopier in the skin, really floppy ears and really long. Awesome. So we have one more question. And I just wanna let you know too, we're looking at about maybe eight to 10 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna have you, you could just be really quick when you answer it. And then that way you can get to the meat stuff because we have a question about that already too. Um, okay. The, quick, the last question about breeds. Um, and I think you sort of touched on this already a little bit was, um, She's shown some red pigs and round robins at fairs. Notice they have a bad temper and aren't very friendly, like the Yorkshires and the pink pigs. Um, is there a reason or is it just genetics? Genetics. Those, most of those white pigs have been bred for confinement operations. And so docility has been bred into them. Whereas a lot of the red type pigs are bred for outdoor operations. And so they, they don't have that human interaction or docility bred into them like the white pigs do. Awesome. Uh, we have one more that's on the cuts of meat when you get there. And, um... Okay, good. Well, we, we'll get to that here in just a little bit. Uh, so what do pigs eat? And like we said, they are omnivores. And they do eat grain. They can eat some forage. Uh, some people do feed garbage to pigs. I don't recommend it. But the real answer is, yeah, almost anything. And all the above is the correct answer there. But I wanted to point out something here because uh, 
pigs can eat some forage, but they're not ruminant animals, so they can't process forage at the same rate as uh, as cows would. So cows are ruminant animals. They have a four-chambered stomach. These are animals like cows, deer, sheep, goats, uh, giraffes, and bison have a four-chambered stomach. Uh, and inside of their stomach uh, lives bacteria, protozoa, and fungi, so, so micro flora and bacteria. Uh, so they actually break down the feed for the animal. And so there are special bacteria that break down forage and then the cow lives off the byproducts of the bugs that live inside their stomach. So animals like horses and rabbits and elephants can also live off forage, but they don't have a four chambered stomach. However, they do have an organ called a cecum, which is a big blind sac between their large and small intestines uh, that also houses bacteria that can break down forage and then the animals can live off the byproducts of that forage. Now pigs, if you look at this picture, have a cecum, but it's very small compared to what the rabbit would be. So pigs cannot live off a forage diet. They ha you have to feed pigs some grain uh, but they can eat some forage. And nutrition is so important with pigs uh, because they need a balanced diet. So if we look at this barrel, uh, this wooden barrel, think of the wooden barrel as the genetic potential for growth of the pig. And you can only fill that barrel to its highest point. So if we are short on one nutrient, so in this uh, example, it's iron, uh, they cannot meet their genetic potential because they're short on iron. It would be the same thing for protein, amino acids, vitamins, other minerals. If you're short on just one nutrient, the animal cannot reach its potential and that's why it's so important to feed a complete feed to your show pigs or your pigs at home uh, because they are balanced to give the pig 100% of its nutritional needs. Now, some people, and this was very common in the United States, they like to feed their pigs slop or, or kitchen scraps or scraps from buffets or schools or, or whatnot. This is actually illegal to sell a pig or sell pork that has been garbage fed. That's the technical term for slopping hogs, unless you have a license uh, to boil the feed for 30 minutes so you can kill all the harmful diseases that could be spread because of that. And so one of those is trichinosis, which is kind of like a worm that lives inside your flesh. Uh, and that was spread from pork to people. And we used to have to cook pork to an internal temperature of 165 degrees to kill that nasty bug. Uh, but since we have quit garbage feeding or slopping hogs on a commercial level, uh, we have uh, basically eliminated that threat of trichinosis. Uh, and now the USDA only recommends that you cook pork steaks or pork chops to 145 degrees. So instead of a burnt shoe leather type pork chop, you now get a moist, tender, succulent pork chop, almost like eating a beef steak. So that's really important. Uh, I've got just a couple trivia things. So we'll go to question four here. Uh, and then we're going to get into the meat stuff and then I, I can take any questions that you may have. So just real quick while they're answering that, uh, the question came up, is slop considered garbage? Yes. Uh, anything that has touched meat, contains meat, or had the potential to be in the same area as meat would be considered slop or garbage. Excellent. Slop Thank is you. the common term. Garbage is the uh, legal term. 
And if you in intend to sell the pigs or intend to sell the pork, it's illegal to slop feed pigs. All right, looks like 63% um, say pig skin, 29 say cow leather, and 8% say rubber. How'd they do? Well, 63% of the people were wrong. Footballs are made out of cowhide. <laughs> uh, footballs have never actually been made from pig skin. Uh, the, the term pig skin comes from a really old ball uh, before really the modern game of football was invented. Uh, folks used to inflate pig bladders and make balls. And that's where the term pig skin comes from. But footballs as we know them are leather and have always been made out of leather uh, unless you buy a rubber or nerf football. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to kind of skip through this and go straight to what do we get from pigs? And so some of these things are obvious and some of these things may surprise you. So old school phonograph records were pressed on material that were rendered from pigs. Uh, bone china come from crushed up pig bones. Uh, violin strings can be made from hog intestines. Uh, the skin over drums, if they are real leather uh, drum heads, can be made from pig hide. Uh, we've got uh, leather, football, oils, uh, glycerin is extracted from pig fat to make things like antifreeze and dynamite, or TNT, not dynamite, uh, linoleum floors, different pet foods, marshmallows are made from gelatin, which comes from bone and bone marrow, uh, lubricant, I'm sorry, industrial lubricants, uh, certain types of rennet for curdling milk into making cheese, uh, hair for paint brushes. So really high-end artist brushes actually use uh, pig hair. Uh, and one of the really neat things is we can actually harvest uh, heart valves from pigs and transplant those into humans. And we can harvest pig insulin and other things from pigs to help diabetic people. And the glycerin that we also use can also be used to make matchstick heads. And I've only got two more slides. And this, this is leading us into the meat discussion. You know, why is it called hamburger and doesn't contain any ham? Hey, looks like we've got about 23 of 29 have voted and um, about 43% think it's named after a place and we have kind of an even split on the other three. <laughs> so the majority is actually correct in this instance. Uh, the term hamburger is actually uh, shortened or, or comes from the, the, the town of Hamburg, Germany. Uh, so when German immigrants moved to the East Coast along the Atlantic coast of the United States, uh, they brought with them a specific cut of uh, beef, which was chopped up uh, beef meat, and then they would flatten it out and cook it like a steak. And so that was called a Hamburg steak. Uh, and not too long after that, uh, some inventive Americans decided, hey, you know, we put one of these Hamburg steaks on a nice Kaiser roll. Uh, we got a really good sandwich. And that's kind of how 
the term hamburger came around, but it has nothing to do with ham of pigs. And that, that brings us to the final slide here. And that is, where do we get our pork from? And so if we look at this cross section of a pig carcass, we'll see that the primal cuts, that's the big sections of the pig where we get different things. So uh, one thing to keep in mind when we talk about chops or pork chops is pork chops can come from all over the pig. A pork chop is basically just a pork steak. Uh, and the term pork chop is so confusing and people really don't know uh, which pork chop comes from which part of the pig that in recent times the pork board is trying to rename uh, pork chops, pork steaks, and use terms that we are familiar with in the beef world, like ribeye and, and T-bone and stuff like that. So you, you'll start seeing that in your grocery store more often is uh, pork chops labeled as beef steak names. Uh, but let's go back to the back leg here, the, the leg primal. That is the ham. So if we were to cut this whole back leg off and cure it and smoke it, that would be a traditional ham. Now the loin back here, the top part, if we were to cut that longismus dorsi or that loin muscle and this top section of ribs, that's what you call the baby back ribs. So the baby back ribs are the, the part of the rib cage that, that has some of that, that top loin muscle on there. And then the rest of the rib cage would be our pork spare ribs. And if you trim off the pork spare ribs and make them real pretty and square, that's where you get your St. Louis style ribs. Okay. Now, also down here, the side or the belly, this is where bacon comes from. So bacon is just a pork belly, literally a pork belly that has been cured and smoked and then sliced thin. So that's where we get bacon from. Now you can also get something similar to bacon if you cut the, if you cure and smoke the jowls of a pig. You can also take part of this upper shoulder and cure it and, and smoke it and slice it and get something called cottage bacon. Uh, but that's not very common here in the United States. So one of the questions that, that might come up in your mind is what's Canadian bacon? And, and Canadian bacon is just the loin muscle. So you'll see the, the picture of this loin here. That is just that really lean, tender loin muscle cured and smoked and sliced thin. And that's Canadian bacon. So what do they call Canadian bacon in Canada? And it's not Canadian bacon. They actually call it back bacon, which makes a lot of sense because the loin comes from the back of the animal. Uh, now, when we get up here to the front shoulder of the animal, this is a little bit confusing because the top muscle is called the Boston butt, even though it's the front shoulder. And the Boston butt is where you get pulled pork. So when you get that really good barbecue sandwich, uh, that comes from that Boston butt. And then the lower part of the, the shoulder along with the shank, uh, that would be called the picnic. So Boston butt, picnic. You can also smoke the, the picnic and make it into a barbecue sandwich that's really good too. Uh, what am I thinking? Now, pork chop, like I said, is basically just a uh, cut of meat that's shaped like a steak. Uh, you can get loin chops, you can get rib chops, which would basically be uh, the baby back rib along with the entire loin muscle, but instead of one big 
uh, long rib cage. It's just each rib is sliced off individually to give you an individual chop. If you were to take the baby back ribs and the loin muscle and cook those as a roast, uh, that is your loin rack. That's the one with the fancy little top hats on the end of the rib bones. Uh, if, if this was a beef cow, that loin rack would be your prime rib. And, you know, you can pickle the feet and have pickled pig feet. Uh, and you can, you can give the pig ears to your, your dogs as treats. And I think I've covered, oh, one of the things I, I meant to say about the chops. So uh, sometimes you'll see something called a center cut chop. And that's basically, they would take the ham or the shoulder and then just slice it with the bone in the middle. That's actually the leg bone running through the middle. That, that, and that's what a center cut chop would be. So, so Colt, I know that we've got um, one quick, I wanna make sure that we get Ashley Jeffers sample in here with the 4-H project. So I'll go ahead and let Ashley start sharing her slides and I think Ashley Wright has a question or two, maybe, <clears throat> while, while Ashley Jeffers Sample starts sharing hers. So go for it, Ashley Wright. Um, you, uh, let me ask, there was a couple of quick ones real quick. So while you guys are getting your slides switched over, um, if you feed veggies, like from a farmer's market or wherever that did not touch any meat, is that allowed? Yes, that is not considered garbage. Also, milk waste from like a dairy is not considered garbage. Awesome. But and then we had one question related to what is the most common cut of meat in a pig? So I guess that would be what is the most, the most sold or the most popular? Uh, there are several. Uh, ham and bacon are the two biggies. And, and then that's probably followed by the ribs the loin and the, uh, and then just the various assorted chops, which come from all over the pig. Awesome. But, so, but usually the ham, the bacon and the ribs are harvested from most commercial pigs. Awesome. So while um, Ashley Jeffer Sample is talking a little bit about the Swine Project in Arizona, if you guys have any additional questions for either of our speakers, um, Colt or Ashley, please put them in the Q&A of the chat. We will get to them after Ashley's um, presentation. And I'll just let you know, just tell me when you want me to share. Oh, God, my goodness. <laughs> I had this come in the mail today from the Farm Bureau, and I thought how ironic because we had this presentation. But anyway, I'll be really short and sweet just to give you an idea of the opportunities um, for um, youth members to get involved in the swine project. Some of you may already be in swine, but make sure to stick around because I might talk about a few opportunities to expand your swine project um, at your county level. Okay, Betsy, if you could switch the slide for me. So some opportunities for you to get involved in the swine project at your county level. And if you don't have all of these opportunities, it's easy to start with it. Um, you just need to make sure you're working with your county agent to bring in one of these new swine opportunities. So the first one and the most common is the market swine project. And that is where you're exhibiting your um, swine and it's being judged for market qualities in the ring, as well as the exhibitor is being judged for showmanship quality. So that's um, a project that every county has and it is available um, when you enter the swine project. But a few of the others that your county may not have, but you might be interested in expanding would be a breeding program. So a great example um, of wanting to start your own swine project and raise your own herd would be to start a breeding gilts project at your county level. So you raise and um, show your gilt based on breeding qualities. So they are um, judged in the ring um, in relation to what their future progeny would look like and how um, successful they would be in creating a herd. And then you have the opportunity to show your own hogs and enter into the bread and fed contest in your county. And then the other aspect that's really neat and not every county has that you might be interested in starting is um, a carcass swine contest. So hogs are judged um, on the hoof. So that means they're judged in the ring 
um, and they're judged for market purposes. And then after that, they're taken to a local harvesting facility and they're judged on the rail. And I think that this um, component of the swine project could be said to be the most important. As some of us know, when we start to get into the show world, um, at times it cannot necessarily mirror production or mirror what the market is looking for. So it's really essential and important that we're teaching our youth members um, what those market um, driven qualities are. And so this gives you a great opportunity to see your hog um, on the rail, which means um, in the slaughterhouse, their carcass hanging and get to judge them on their meat qualities and how well you would do if you owned a production herd. And then the last one that's not just um, for swine, but is open to all uh, large stock um, opportunities is a livestock judging and a skillathon team. So it's a great opportunity to showcase what you know about the swine project whether that be um, judging, whether that be equipment that you know that's applicable to the skillathon, um, ear notching. So it's a great opportunity to show off your swine skills and knowledge, as well as learn a little bit more about a few other um, large stock projects. Okay, Betsy, next slide. Thanks for sharing this for me. Okay, and then just a few opportunities continued that are outside of 4-H, but 4-H is a great pathway to get you involved in these our Arizona National Livestock Show. I know that this year that's looking a little bit different, but um, these opportunities are kind of um, more on non-COVID years. And so at Arizona National Livestock, it's here in Arizona. I suggest that even if you're not showing, you go down there and you visit, you get to see what those shows look like. They have um, a market and a breeding show, and you can also get involved in, few, in a few of the contests that are open to the youth. So that's livestock judging, a skillathon contest, um, a poster contest that you can do about your swine project, a prepared public speaking contest, again, that you can do about swine, and there's great prizes associated with that. And then, of course, there's some camps and um, trainings, whether that be Next Level. Next Level is a wonderful um, camp that I always suggest, the show right trainings. And then it's always great to get some extra practice, whether that be Sailor Shows, the Route 66 show, and then Western National Roundup, um, which is another great opportunity where 4-H takes you to showcase your swine skills, whether it be in livestock judging or in skillathon. And then my final slide. Don't forget that this opportunity goes in your record book. So um, go ahead and make sure you're writing down this date because attending this AZ I at Home webinar is a state event. So make sure that you are writing this down in your project book as attending um, a state webinar on your swine project. But that is all I have in terms of opportunities for the swine project at your county level. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Jeffer Sample, not to be our 4-H agent, not to be confused with Ashley Wright, our livestock agent. Um, a lot of Ashleys in Vermont or in Arizona. Sorry, I don't know where Vermont came from. Maybe because it's it's cold here, cold. So we have questions. We have some questions that have come up. Uh, one thing for you, Ashley Jeffer Sample. What states have youth show in ties? is obviously Arizona, because those are your pictures, you know, where you had the, the gentleman with his tie. Oh, yeah, those are all, um, those are actually from my county in Arizona. So Greenlee County, which is like Duncan, Marinci, um, Southern, Southeastern Arizona, for those of you that aren't familiar. But yes, we do show in ties up here. And it's always um, a trend that you could bring back. It looks like California shows in ties as well. And so this is, this is excellent. Um, Ashley Wright, you, there's some questions I know that we've missed. Oh, Maine does not show in ties. I can't see Colt in a tie. <laughs> um, I saw Colt answered a few of them in the chat. So let's just go ahead and go through them real quick. If I can get scrolled back in the chat here. Just a little bit, there we go. Um, let's see, uh, can you, where does the, where does the bacon come from again? Um, and Colt answered in the chat that bacon comes from the pig belly and the side between the ribs and the back legs. And then about how long does it take uh, commercial pigs to reach market weight? And the answer to that is about five and a half to six months old. 
when they reach market uh, slaughter weight. And, um, and that they're very feed efficient. They gain about one pound of live weight or body weight for every two and a half to three pounds of food that they consume. Did I get them all? I believe I got them all. Um, are there any, let me just check one more time. Um, we have I don't additional see any questions. additional questions. So, all right. With that, I think that we are finished for today. You yeah, so you, you should be getting a, a, next day, you should be getting an email with a link to a survey that helps us a bunch and gives us feedback. We certainly want to thank our presenter, Dr. Colt Knight from University of Maine, but he's, he's an Arizona guy too, because he was here. And then also Ashley Jeffers Sample telling us about 4-H and swine. And so I think if we don't have any other questions, then the, the panelists will stay on for a minute to finish our business. Um, so don't leave us yet, Colt. <laughs> but um, we thank you all for attending. In two weeks, we will on the 17th, I believe it is. I think you shared that in chat, Ashley. We will have a I horse did, I, webinar. I shared the link to our webpage that has all of our upcoming webinars. And the next one is December 17th. And then after that, it's January with turkeys. Is that right? Uh, chickens. 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 Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll go ahead and let you guys sign off. How many times a day to feed? Uh, that's one question for you there, Coulter. That, that's a good question. If you are raising market hogs, uh, a commercial breed of market hogs, you should give them free choice feed. So as much food as they want to eat. If you are raising a heritage breed pig, it's best to feed those two times a day and limit feed them. Uh, now, if you've got mature animals like sows and whatnot, uh, you only have to feed them one time a day, but I have found they're much happier if you just break that in half and feed them twice a day. And I'll, I'll tell you one last secret for you guys that are still on there. His, his little piglets that he has are very, very cute. <laughs> okay, so it looks like with that, we'll go ahead and say goodbye to you guys. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you down the road.